All right. Hey, good morning, folks. Um, thanks for coming. I know it's early. I know there's a lot of really cool stuff happening this morning, so uh, I really appreciate that you're here. Welcome to OpenUSD Day. We have uh, some really awesome talks lined up for you. I'm Max Pickley. I'm the product manager for the Omniverse Spatial Framework on the Omniverse team. And uh, I just finished my first trip around the sun at NVIDIA. And before this, I was over at Pixar doing lighting and also some VR development there for a number of years. Today, I'm going to talk about our framework and, uh, and Omniverse and some of the types of problems that we're trying to solve with, uh, with this extension. I have the pleasure of going first. So if you're not super familiar with Omniverse, it's our development platform for folks to build really high-end applications that leverage kind of decades of amazing research um, that we've done at NVIDIA. Things like our RTX renderer, NBL, our material system, our spatial framework is up here, which I'm really happy about, um, other things like physics. And so really, it's kind of a springboard of tools for you to go and build applications that are going to rely on accurate lighting, accurate physics, and stuff like that. And, uh, and VR is a really great home for some of these tools to wind up. And that's really what our spatial framework is for. It's how we're going to plug in that ray tracer, our material system, other bits and bobs of the Omniverse ecosystem into some really common VR and XR APIs. So we can do mixed reality compositing with OpenXR, and that's going to get us on headsets like the Magic Leap 2 um, and the Vario XR3. Here's a cool demo that we did with our friends at GM. This is a really um, intense CAD data set being rendered on Omniverse and then composited on device in the Vario XR3. And then, of course, we also do just fully immersive stereo rendering. Um, that's with SteamVR and OpenXR. So that brings us to more headsets like the Vive um, and the MetaQuest headsets. And then we also have CloudXR, which is NVIDIA's VR streaming uh, API. And we actually ship a little companion app for uh, iOS and iPadOS that um, allows you to render remotely on a machine and then stream to, to one of these devices. This is my colleague trying to convince me that he got a new car, but we also learned that his Wi-Fi doesn't reach to his driveway very well. So I think across sort of all these devices and APIs, we have a really good coverage of different types of immersive experiences. And what's great is they all plug into kind of this single uh, framework that is Omniverse. And so we now actually ship the spatial framework uh, in our reference application, and that's USD Composer, which is kind of our example of like the type of application you could build um, on Omniverse. And so it's a great way to quickly craft uh, a beautiful USD stage and then jump into it uh, in a headset. And then you also get lots of other great uh, USD Composer features. So you can do multi-user workflows where you could have a user on a desktop and a user in a headset, and they can be in the same stage together. And then we also have our custom UI system, Omni UI, that we've brought to VR. So now you can craft extensions that will work on the desktop, but then you can also access them uh, through a headset. And so with this framework, it's, it's part of our sort of kit extension system. And the idea is you can quickly kind of put all of these pieces together and build an application or a service. Um, we're really stoked to kind of be a part of this giant kind of omniverse ecosystem. It's all extendable with Python. And uh, we're kind of just getting started with XR being part of this. And we're really excited to see where folks take it. So if you want to learn more, head to this address. There's tons of docs, videos, um, great examples to get going on Kit. So I'm going to spend some time today kind of discussing why we've built this framework uh, in the hopes that you leave here with some new ideas and inspiration for sort of where this cutting edge hardware and software can live in your workflow and your pipeline. And I think it's a really important time to be kind of weaving together things like ray tracing and open USD uh, and spatial computing. I feel like a lot of industries that once dabbled in digital previs are kind of now investing heavily in this space. And you'll hear us call that digital twins all throughout the day today. Uh, I think the benefits of seeing and iterating uh, digitally on something that's going to become a physical space or a product, like a car or a building or a factory, are really starting to be realized because we're getting so much better at building them and simulating them and rendering them. 
Um, but what we've noticed is that unlike a film or a video game or an animation, uh, the final product isn't always gonna be something you experience through proscenium or on a flat screen. They're gonna be out here in the physical world with us. And so um, if we're gonna do that, what better way to experience that uh, early than with immersive computing? So if you're trying to see what it's like to sit in a car when it's in the early stages of design, uh, or if you're trying to figure out the ergonomics of an assembly bay um, for factory planning, then of course you want to test that and iterate on that immersively because that's gonna be out in the real world and experienced in, uh, in this physical space. So we're kind of early on kind of figuring out these workflows, but um, you know, one mantra that I sort of try to keep in mind from my film days is like this idea of trust the process and sort of like what does that mean um, for people who are trying to get into to digital twins and I think there's a lot to sort of unpack there, but for me, what I think it means is this trust that everybody working in their discipline is gonna have the ability to iterate on what they're really good at as much as they can. And so like if it's early on on the design of a character and you can't quite see where it's gonna go yet, um, having a process that you trust means that you know everybody who's gonna work on that character is gonna have the ability to iterate to the best of their ability. And so it's no surprise that OpenUSD is cut from the same cloth as that mantra. It's why there's things like sparse overrides. So your incremental changes aren't these wholesale copies of giant data sets. They're beautiful, human-readable files that are easy to store uh, and transmit. It's why we have opinions in the layer stack so that artists can confidently iterate alongside each other um, rather than being siloed from one another. And it's also why the wider that we see USD adopted um, in applications, the easier it is to move your data back and forth from tool to tool. So we wanna build these digital twins and then we wanna experience them um, and test them with spatial computing because um, that's the closest we're gonna get to experiencing that physical copy. But we know that there's some really significant pain points in, uh, in this uh, lofty goal preparing assets to run on the constrained compute of a headset is extremely time consuming and complex. There's usually a small amount of video memory on some of these mobile devices uh, and giant texture files. And then more importantly, not every tool in a pipeline is gonna have a VR or XR implementation. And so what do you do if you have people working in your pipeline who um, their particular application doesn't have a VR framework built on it? And then of course, once you have everything running immersively, it's actually really difficult to build that loop where you can constantly be pulling new data um, into your VR experience. And then more importantly, nothing can really leave that experience and go back down into your pipeline. I feel like each of these problems kind of creates a situation where VR um, lives out at the edge of your pipeline, but also even worse, it tends to live at sort of one point in your pipeline. You kind of have to decide where in my pipeline am I gonna to start to branch off and build my, my VR experience? Uh, and artists aren't sort of used to not having that instant gratification. They can see their work on a screen. Why would they wait to go through this whole process of getting something into a headset um, when they're used to just having it at their fingertips? So this is kind of the problem area that we're focused on uh, on our team. And we think that ray tracing and OpenUSD uh, is really gonna be the best way to try to solve these. Uh, ray tracing in stereo at 90 hertz is uh, not easy, but we can actually do some really fun tricks with our ray tracer. So we can fire rays just in the area of the image that are important. And then this foveation system that we have is really extensible. So as we start to put things on like um, eye tracking, and uh, in the case of something like Avaria, which has four displays, we can kind of continue to guide our rays to the most important part of the image um, and try to keep that performance really high. And also it's ray tracing. We get like beautiful real-time lighting that doesn't have to be baked or rebaked if you change geometry or textures or anything like that. And then thanks to kind of the inherent acceleration structure of a ray tracer, um, we can throw hundreds of millions of polygons at this system and we're only gonna worry about uh, uh, what we can actually raycast and hit. So again, that kind of really eliminates that need 
to remove all this data that maybe you had a car model that literally had every um, piece inside of it, uh, but uh, it's just gonna be handled uh, quite handily. And then of course, as we make all these improvements to AI, those are gonna make their way to things like our denoiser, which we continue to improve um, and really lean on uh, to help us get an image back at the frame rate that we need. So here's an undenoised image out of our ray tracer. And here it is denoised and cleaned up. And then this is actually last year's denoiser. And so year over year, um, the fidelity and, and the quality of this continues to grow, which I think is super exciting. And then we're gonna use, use, we're gonna use USD to sort of create these amazing connections to all those disparate tools that might be in your pipeline that maybe don't have a VR or an AR mode. Um, I think it's really important for your data to continue to live in the tool that the artists are working in. The moment you tell them their data has to leave that tool, um, they're done iterating at that point. And so, uh, and I think that's vital for kind of making this successful uh, loop. And so now that we're in USD, we can kind of keep all these modifications that we typically make to get something ready for VR um, and leave that source of truth intact. And so maybe somebody's working on this, this uh, rim, somebody else is gonna do the materials and the animation, but these are all overrides uh, on that original source of truth of that wheel. And then most importantly, by bridging all of these tools together and all this data together, um, we can make sort of one holistic VR experience. So again, it doesn't matter where in your pipeline you are, uh, sort of where in your process you are, uh, you can always have it accessible in a common um, uh, experience. And so you're not seeing, say, differences in renderers as you move from VR tool to VR tool. Uh, it's all gonna stay really consistent. So that ray tracing helps us visualize this data with less prep. USD gives us access to that data in a really beautiful, non-destructive fashion. And we think combining these two allows you to experience your work immersively, kind of anywhere in your pipeline, sort of lowering the bar for what's needed to iterate on a digital twin, and hopefully getting you closer to a process that you can trust. So let me show you some neat examples of, of how this works. These are pretty simple. Here's a stage from our new architecture demo pack that's out there. Uh, Krista is up in Seattle with the source data for this trellis open in Grasshopper, which is a really awesome uh, tool for, for Rhino. It doesn't have a VR mode. So I'm down in the Bay Area. I have this stage uh, open. I have a, a time of day study going. I have some beautiful cesium tiles to sort of see the cityscape around where this building's gonna be. And Krista is able to stay in Rhino, update this trellis work, and uh, I'm on my iPad, but I could just as easily be in a headset, and I'm able to actually evaluate that work as she's uh, iterating on this. And this is like a simple example, but hopefully it kind of gives you an idea of kind of how you can, you can build this out. Here's another example where um, Terry and I are working on this car interior. Terry's up in, uh, in C uh, St. Louis. He's in Substance Designer. And again, this is sort of that context that I'm talking about. Terry is just working on this car seat. That's the only asset that he's focused on right now. But my context is different. I need to see these changes in the context of the whole car um, with the correct lighting uh, and reflections. And so again, he's able to stay comfortably in that tool, keep working on what he's working on, um, and I'm still able to get it into a headset right away. So we think this is pretty neat. We're pretty excited about the future of this technology. Um, we're not alone. It's been great to see our friends over at Apple also put USD at the center of their spatial computing platform. And so we think these workflows are going to continue to become the standard for how we interact with uh, and iterate on digital twins immersively. I think it's also easy to look into the future and see the need for a composition engine like OpenUSD. So more and more of these devices are gonna be scanning and inferring our surroundings. And we're gonna to have to be layering uh, our handmade data on top of real world data that's always changing and live. And I can't think of a better system to sort of do that with than OpenUSD. And then generative AI is gonna be the next layer uh, on top of that. It's gonna be a way that we're gonna use our, our input and our voice to sort of manipulate these large data sets. 
And I think that's going to make it even more important to have a non-destructive iteration workflow uh, uh, for all these problems. And then we also want to continue to build these tools in a way where the compute can scale up. We know that these devices are going to continue to focus on weight, on battery life, on heat dissipation, and comfort. And so if we can offload the compute to the cloud, we can make sure that really what those devices are going to need to sort of focus on for the next years, focus on that, and we can keep focusing on making these pipelines and these images richer and more complex. So here's a link to get started. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about today, and I have some time for, uh, for questions. So thanks so much for coming.